Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Good morning. So glad that you're here. Welcome in Center Court East. Welcome in Center Court West. Welcome in the Woodlands. Welcome online. However it is that you're here, we're just really glad uh, that you're here today. Take your Bibles, and if you need a Bible, why don't you flag uh, down an usher, and they'll be glad to let you borrow one of those. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 3 momentarily. Acts chapter 3 in the New Testament in just a moment. Now, most of you know, unless you've just come in perhaps in the last three months, I came within hours of dying of a massive heart attack that I had no idea was about uh, to get me. But through a set of no less than 10 or 12, apparently, but not really, uh, random events that God was so clearly orchestrating, I was intercepted and found my way (laughs) into the cath lab, and, and here I am, feeling great. That experience is one that I, I don't think a day has gone by that I've not thought through all that happened that day. It just really has gotten to me and has reawakened in me the absolute total certainty that I have deep in my soul that God is alive, he is well, he is working, he's bringing health, he's bringing wholeness, and he's bringing healing still today in people's lives. And that's where we're talking about today, uh, this thing of healing. Uh, We've been looking at this man, Peter, the disciple Peter, arguably the best known of all the 12 apostles. Now, if you follow along here in Peter's life, you know that it's sort of like a 747. If you ever flown a 747, you're going down the runway, and it just feels like you're going and going, and you wonder, is this thing ever going to get off the ground before we run to the end of the runway. And that is a picture of sort of what Peter seems like to me when you read through his life's uh, uh, scenes in the Gospels. It's just going along, you're like, is this guy ever going to take off and get it and really become a disciple of Jesus? Because he was always botching it up. He was impulsive and he was spontaneous. He was careless. He said things that he didn't really mean to say and made commitments he, he couldn't really keep. And, and it, he was really sort of this mess uh, as we're going along, right up to the point where the night before Jesus would go to the cross, he denies even knowing Jesus three times. His best friend, I tell you, I don't even know that man who you're talking about. Why? Because it wasn't popular right about then to be associated with Jesus. But then Pastor Dan took us through those beautiful verses uh, last Sunday where Jesus, after the resurrection, comes back, meets with Peter, and restores him. Through those three times he asks uh, Peter, do you love me? Almost canceling out each of the three times that Peter had denied even knowing Jesus. That's a beautiful scene. And then soon thereafter, Jesus goes back to heaven, and about a couple of months later, boom, the Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit upon all the Christians on the face of the earth. And the word that the Bible writers use to describe when the Holy Spirit came was dunamis. It's the same etymology as our word dynamite. In other words, what they were saying is it was, you just, it was a power that you could not mistake. Bam! When the Holy Spirit came here and moved in on people's lives. And you certainly see this happen in Peter's life. When the Holy Spirit got a hold of Peter, he was a transformed person. No longer in the book of Acts do we read about this careless, uh, impulsive, uh, can't really keep his word, unfaithful, uh, embarrassing kind of disciple. That's not what we see in the book of Acts. He's totally a transformed person. Now he's bold, he's courageous, he's just a different person. I guess you could really say he was healed of all of those character deficiencies that had characterized his life. But, of course, God never heals anybody along the way just for the story to end with them. He gives us healing so that we then, in turn, may go and minister to other people God's love and grace and gospel and healing. 
And that's exactly what we see that happens here in Acts chapter 3. So with that background in mind, let's look at Acts chapter 3. Peter, uh, here early in the story, after the Holy Spirit has come, we're seeing evidence. This is a new man. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried into the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So you have this man who has uh, been crippled all of his life. We don't really know how many years that is until you get over to Acts chapter 4, verse 22, and you find out 40 years, more than 40 years, this was his existence. And so he had been just physically di- you know, disabled, challenged all of his life. Clearly, though, he didn't have any... Um, Uh, mental challenges. He was pretty strategic, in fact, and realized if there was a good place to to, to position himself, that would be right as people were going into the temple. Why? Because that's where they could be generous and fulfill the Jewish custom of alms giving on their way in. So he's pretty strategic to get himself positioned by that gate called Beautiful. There's lots of gates around the temple, but this one was called Beautiful. It had bronze and ornate, and it was quite something apparently. So apparently this man had done this for years. That just sort of was his place. Perhaps he learned, even as a child, how to sort of drag himself across the floor on his hands. And he probably didn't have many friends because he was very different. And people in those days kind of especially were careful about different sorts of people. He certainly would have been married. Uh, Maybe... Also, it was because people were afraid that if they were to draw near him, they might end up almost catching a little bit of what had befallen him. And this was interesting. He couldn't go inside the temple courts because people with special needs couldn't go inside the temple courts in those days. It was just the custom of the law back then. So he stayed outside. And the people, as they were streaming inside, would toss their coins in his can. And so there he sat. Now, as I was pondering it, it occurs to me, you and I, we pass people like this every day. You work with them. You might even be related to them. You might even live in the same house with them. I'm not even necessarily speaking so much of people who are, who are crippled with the ankles or the feet. Because I'm thinking of any number of other ways that people are crippled, paralyzed uh, today. Some people, I know any number of people who are sort of emotionally crippled. And they wrestle with something like depression at a very deep level. Sometimes so deeply they can't even move out of their room into the day. It is absolutely crippling. And though some uh, who mean well might say, shake it off, just come on. You can't shake that off because depression is a disease just like diabetes or cancer. Some, they wrestle with sort of a relational paralysis. They just can't seem to make meaningful relationships. Others yet um, 
There are marriages that feel paralyzing. Even my mentioning the word marriage makes some of you just have this crippling sense when you think about yours. And others are vocationally paralyzed. That you've, some of you, you feel trapped, like, almost like you're a caged animal and you just can't even get out from, from where you are and what you do. And, and others of you are crippled in a different way. You can't seem to get a job and keep a job. And that's very crippling as well. And so when you frame it this way, you realize all of us, we know a lot of people who are like this man. And our fast-paced world doesn't encourage us to slow down, does it? And to care for such people, to help them along and to minister to them. So we just also kind of keep walking. At least that's what we're told to do, just to keep on walking. And don't give them much attention. Don't slow down that much. Well, this was the man's situation. Everybody just kept walking by him as they were going into the temple court where he's not allowed to go. But then look what happens. Verse 4, Peter and John, they come along. Peter looked at him. And John did too. And Peter says, look at us. Now, don't you know that was a different sound to this man's ears? I I have to imagine he could not remember the last time anybody said to him, look look at me. Let me see your eyes. And subsequently, I'm sure he just learned how to sort of avert his eyes, as many times people do in that situation, just not to quite have to look at other people, just sort of hold his can out as if to say, look, I'll just make this easier for both of us. You just sort of drop in what you need to drop in to feel good, and I'll appreciate it. But neither of us will feel great about the arrangement. But Peter, he doesn't play that game. He says, no, look at us. Look at us. Why? Because you're not trash. You might feel like you're trash, but you're not trash. God made you. The same God who made us, he made you too. And so we can look into each other's eyes. We're both created in his image. You're valuable is, is, is what he's doing. There. It's this beautiful picture, sort of the picture that you pick up in Psalm uh, 3, verse 3, where it says, Thou, O Lord, are shield about me and the lifter of my head. You just get this, this picture of the, of the Lord just sort of taking our, our chin or our cheeks and just saying, look into my eyes. I'm your heavenly Father. I created you. And this is a beautiful scene uh, that's going on here. So Peter says those things uh, in verse 6, and uh, he, he goes on. Let's see what he does then. He says to the man, silver or gold, I do not have. In other words, we're poor too. <laughs> you know, we, we haven't had a steady job for about three years. Uh, we've been following this man, Jesus, and we haven't been fishing like we used to be. We're poor too. So, but what I do have I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he pulls him up by the right hand. (laughs) The man doesn't even need rehab. Wham, he's just healed right there. Now, what a powerful thing. And then all of the people, it says, start seeing the man. And they're like, we know who that man is. We've passed by him many times, and here he is, and he's walking. And it's sort of this ripple effect, this domino tipping effect that happens when the Lord does a work in our midst. Now, when, when we hear stories like this, many times today, people uh, like you and me, we, we tend to think, you know, it sure would have been cool to live back there, wouldn't it have? To, when, when we could really see powerful miracles, the hand of God just, just working and just healings like that. Wish we could have lived back then when they really happened. Trust me. They still happen today. I'm acutely aware that he's still in the business of doing these very sorts of things, even today. 
And so in just a few moments, we're going to come to the Lord's table, and we're going to have the Lord's Supper and, and have some opportunities for prayer. I want to talk to you a few more minutes beforehand. But, but I just want you to know that's, just, that's kind of where we're going uh, in just a moment. We're going to ask him to come with his, his dunamis, that power of the Holy Spirit. Just do something in our midst. No matter which room you're in today or even if you're online, however it is, we're just going to pray that God would touch those of us who really need some type of healing touch in our lives. I want to address a couple of things, though. Uh, more before we do that. Because many times I think when we bring up this subject of healing, there is in certain branches of the church a, a misconception. It's not really, it's, a, it's an error. It's a heresy. And, and it is this, that if you pray for healing and you ask God for healing and you don't get the healing that you asked for, that you must not have had enough faith. And I just want to sock that one right in between the eyes because I, I point you to the text. Where do you see in this text this man having any faith about getting healed? He wasn't even sitting there hoping to get healed that day. He was just sitting there hoping to get some money. He got immeasurably more than he had gone there that day asking or imagining he might get. Okay, so, so there was no faith component in it for him. And I think we do a great disservice to people when we, when we sort of lay that, oh, well, you must not have enough faith. This man had no faith. And neither did the man in a very similar story. One of Jesus' first miracles was a similar type of story, also a paralyzed man. Go back and you read about it. You, maybe you heard it before at Luke chapter 5. There's this man who was paralyzed, and his friends, they put him on this mat. You remember? And they take him because they're going to go get him to Jesus because they figure if anybody can do anything, Jesus can do it. And they get him there to the house, and the house is so full of people who are trying to get into Jesus, they couldn't get him in, so they'd go up on the roof and they cut the hole in the roof and they drop the man down or they don't drop him they lower him down before Jesus and there he comes before Jesus and what does it say in Luke chapter 5 verse 20 it says when Jesus saw their faith not the man lying there but their faith he did his work he forgave the man he healed the man and so here we see again that man didn't seem to have any faith that God was... Who had the faith? It was his friends, the people around him. I suppose, therefore, people will come along and, and say from that, well, then the burden of faith must fall not on the person being prayed for. It must fall on the people doing the praying. So if you pray for me and I don't get healed, it's your fault. You didn't have enough faith. Give me another batch. Come try it. You know, and, and, But that would be a bad thing to do as well because there's plenty of prayer people in, in scripture and throughout church history who have prayed for one another and they had plenty of faith, but God didn't bring the healing, at least not exactly the way that they had been asking for it to come. And, and so I think what we have to be careful about doing is, is just this sort of uh, formalizing and that's what concerns me, is I see some Christians trying to sort of formalize. If you do this and this and those people do that, then boom, it'll always happen. If you, do, if you were to say that, friends, you're essentially saying, I've figured out God. I've got him in a little bottle, you know, sort of like a chemistry experience. If you drop two parts of this in the tube and four parts of this, wham, every time. It, God is not a chemistry experience, experiment. He, he, he's not formulizable. He, he, he's not going to be confined to that. Now, there is some faith component required in the mix. We don't know how that factors in. In fact, at one point, Jesus goes into a village, and he says to them, there's not going to be any miracles here. Why? Because there's no faith here. So there is some component of faith, but we've got to be very careful about laying the burden of guilt or blame, or if nothing happened, well, it must have been your fault because you just didn't have enough faith. Nonsense. We don't, con we don't get to, to control him. He is God. He is our provider, Jehovah uh, Jireh. He's our healer, Jehovah Rapha. But he's not Jehovah Genie. And so don't try to put him in a bottle and pop him out the way that you think that that's just how it all... There's, there's mystery in this. There's some, in fact, if you can't find a little mystery in the Lord, then I would question whether you've really met the Lord, the real Lord. Um, so sometimes he doesn't heal. 
even the, the very way. And, and it's not related to faith, apparently. I think of the Apostle Paul. You remember the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, he, he talked about this thorn in his flesh. He never tells us exactly what the thorn in his flesh was, um, metaphorically speaking, but he, he said three times I asked, Lord, would you please take this away? Would you please heal it? And, but he didn't. But he did something, in fact, perhaps better. What did he do? He said to Paul, my grace will be sufficient for you. I'm not going to take that away, but I am going to give you my grace and that's going to carry you through. That's going to be more than enough. And I'll work through that. So we keep that in mind. And also keeping in mind that ultimate healing for all of us, final healing, because all of us finally don't get healed at some point, right? Because there's an end point of this life. Ultimate healing comes for all of us who've named Christ on the other side. That's where total, full, final healing comes. One more thing that sometimes I hear people, especially in this country, say. They say something like, well, you know, it doesn't seem like God's doing very many miracles in this part of the world. Now, you go over to India, you go over to Africa, wow, there's some powerful thing. God is at work over there. I'm not saying he's not. He is absolutely at work over there, but I think we need to be careful to, again, sort of pass judgment on God and say, well, he's not doing anything over here. No. Follow this with me. Might it be that in those parts of the world where they don't have hospitals, they don't have doctors, they don't have nurses, they don't have chemotherapy, they don't have insulin, all the stuff that we have at weight loss clinics, it's a big problem over here. They don't have those problems. They don't have those, they don't have those advantages. So there's a bigger gap between the infirmity, the need, and healing. So when God bridges that gap, it could appear, oh, wow, there's an old-fashioned miracle. But I'm here to tell you, especially after what happened to me on January 5th, you will never convince me that God is any less powerful or wonderful or divine or miraculous over on this part of the world than he is over there. But that he might, in fact, just be utilizing all of the things th that he's seen fit to let us have on this side. We've got many blessings and opportunities. So he's still bridging the gap. He might just be doing it through a hospital or through a medication or through a doctor or through a weight loss clinic or, or something. Let's, let's, let's not sell God short, though. He is very much at work in all of those. <clears throat> all right. I think those are most of the things that I wanted to say. Oh, let's talk about one other thing. And that is, let, I, I think this is a particularly uh, good. Warren Wiersbe points out, let's not forget this marvelous picture that comes through the passage here in Acts chapter 3. This, this, this crippled man's story. He says it, it's really quite uh, a parallel, quite a picture of really our, everybody's condition, all of our condition, spiritually speaking. Wiersbe writes, the man, he was born lame physically, even as all of us are born unable, spiritually speaking, to ever walk in a way that will be pleasing to God, not on our own. Why? Because our original father, Adam, had a fall. And he passed his lameness on to all of his descendants. That's you and me. All of us have been infected by sin. And even as the man in this story was poor, we, spiritually speaking, we're bankrupt before God Unable to pay, ever pay back any debts that we would owe to him. And even as this beggar sat outside the temple, separated from the goings-on inside the temple, without Christ, we too are found outside, separated from him. But even as this man was healed wholly by the power and the grace of our Lord, we too 
through trusting in what he did on the cross and in the resurrection thereafter, conquering the grave, we too are saved and transformed and healed by the same grace and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so really, all of us can find ourselves in this story in some shape, form, or fashion. So today, perhaps, some of you, you just need to put your trust in Jesus. That's as much sermon as you need right there because you've never really just opened your life up even to Jesus in the first place. And you just need to say, I need you, I need a savior. I need to repent of my sins. I want to trust in what you did on the cross, dying as my substitute and rising again. I'm putting my faith in you. It might be spiritual healing that you need today. You need the gospel. You need the good news. You need Jesus. Others of you, you might have some, some other type of need for healing. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's marital. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's vocational. Um, maybe it's uh, sort of psychological or neurological. So, to, there's any sorts of ways. And maybe today, the action step for you is just to say, I need healing. Lord, would you please touch me and heal me? Maybe it's from the sort of the character deficiencies. Maybe you've got a recurring um, pattern, sort of like Peter did, that impulsivity, that carelessness, that blurt out-ishness that, that Peter couldn't seem to control. Maybe you do that. Maybe you're just a gossip, and you just need the Lord to touch you and just say, would you... Let me just heal you, because you talk too much, you know? Or maybe there's unfaithfulness, like Peter was unfaithful, or cowardice. Um, maybe that's where he needs you, to, to heal you, or where you need him to touch you for healing. Or maybe it's physical. Maybe you, you need somebody to just pray for you for a certain thing. Maybe it is cancer. Um, heart issues or any number of other sorts of things and maybe you just need to, to, to come today and just say I'm, I'm asking the Lord would you bring healing I'm telling you he does he is still in the business of doing it about a week ago I was telling our staff what I was going to talk about today and one of our Staff members, uh, Michael Sullivan, Sully, as he's affectionately known around here, Sully came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, Pastor Ken, <laughs> I kind of have a story of healing myself. And he told me what it was and I thought, well, I'm going to share that with you all before we come for prayer. Take a look at the screens. So in August, I was playing basketball up here at Faith Bridge, and I just went up for a layup and came down kind of in an awkward position and, and felt a pop in my knee. So when I got up, I tried to kind of, you know, walk it off or, or whatever. But a few weeks into September, I realized I, I can walk, but that's about it. I can't run. I can't move side to side. So all the things that I enjoy doing, all the activities that I wanted to do, I could no longer do. And so I went uh, to see a knee specialist. He started moving my knee around and, and kind of trying to determine what the issue might be. And to set my expectations rightly, he told me, your ACL's torn. We'll have to do an MRI to confirm that. But just know going into it, it's probably going to be a six-month process with therapy and surgery and all that kind of stuff. I went to our all-staff meeting on Tuesday morning, and we were in the middle of the Jesus Is series, and Ken was teaching on Jesus Is Healer. And I was sitting in the back of the room as he was inviting people to come forward thinking, I'm not the person he's talking to. This is for serious things, things that are bigger than just a knee. And so I was sitting back thinking, I'm not going to come forward, but just kept feeling this urge that no, go forward, go receive prayer. And so I, I went up and received prayer from Ken that day, that Tuesday morning. Uh, but Friday I went in for the MRI as planned, went through the whole process. And they called me 
I guess it was about a week later to tell me that there was absolutely nothing wrong with my knee. There was no swelling, there was no tear, nothing was wrong. And so I began to go back to normal physical activities and have been able to lead our ultimate Frisbee missional community and continue doing all the physical activities that I have before, so much so that somebody asked me recently, which knee was it that you were hurt? And I couldn't even remember because I've been fully restored back to normal. Yeah, isn't that cool? Praise the Lord. So James said, you have not because you asked not in chapter 4, verse 3. So we're going to uh, come and we're just going to ask him, would you uh, do a work here? Now, uh, I'm, we're going to kind of do two things at the same time. Um, we're also going to come to the Lord's table and just remember that great sacrifice that Christ made in coming. And the reminder that he left us with. That night before he went to the cross, when he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, and it's broken for you. And so I want you to come and take it and eat it. And as you do, you're going to remember what I came to do for you. And then he took the cup, and he said, this cup is representative of my blood, and it's poured out for the forgiveness of your sins, and I want you to drink it. And as you do, you're going to remember me. So in the next few moments, we're going to just have the musicians will come back and we'll have some time to just sing and to worship. And the ushers are going to lead you. And you can just come forward as they lead and come up to the front of whichever room you're positioned in today. And you'll find the pieces of the bread already broken and the grape juice. And you can just take a piece of the bread and dip it in and then partake. And if you need the gluten-free elements, they've put them today right smack dab here in the middle of every room. So you can just kind of come towards the middle if you need the gluten-free elements. Sometimes people ask, um, can I come even if I'm like brand new here, I'm not a member here, I don't come here, I'm from out of town? Sure, as long as there's only one requirement, and it's not our requirement. It's just the, the, the request that you know the Lord or you want to start knowing him today. This is his table. It's not our table. It's the Lord's table. And so uh, with that in mind, in a moment, you just come as you feel led. And we're going to put the, I think they're already there. The prayer partners are on the sort of the sides of the room, uh, not right up here in the front, but just kind of on the sides. Why don't you go towards one of them and you just ask them, on your way back to your chair. Would you play, pray for me healing for this, whatever it is? And they'll just uh, pray for healing. We'll just ask God, would you work today? Let me pray for us as we get ready. Lord, now, thank you for the powerful ways that throughout history you have shown up. You work, you do amazing things, and we give you the glory for all of it. Of course we do. All grace is amazing. And you're the one who gives it. And, and so thank you, Lord. Thanks for the way that you transformed Peter. And you took him from kind of a knucklehead into being this powerful disciple. You touched him and you changed him. When your Holy Spirit filled him up, that was really the clincher. And then you used him. And you didn't just heal him and transform him for his own end, but then he turned around and he became useful for thousands of others. And including this man that we've looked at today, who got up and he walked, jumped, praised you. Lord, my prayer is that you would come even now in every room that we're meeting in. And just by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would work And we won't try to put you in a test tube. We won't try to formulize you and say, here's what God's going to do. We're just going to come and say, God, we're open and we're asking. And would you just come and do your thing in us? Won't you bring healing? Meet with us now as we come and as we commune with you. Lord, we pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. 
Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre. Welcome to Postscript. I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just gave an awesome message on healing today. And Pastor Ken, I noticed that the two services were a little bit different from each other. What happened there? Yes, that was my bad. Because in the 9 o'clock service, I called for the video testimony. That's a great testimony. And in the 11 o'clock service, I just got going along and totally forgot it. And that was my bad. Well, fortunately, we actually have the clip right here for you right now. So in August, I was playing basketball up here at Faith Bridge, and I just went up for a layup and came down kind of in an awkward position and and felt a pop in my knee. So when I got up, I tried to kind of, you know, walk it off or or whatever. But a few weeks into September, I realized I, I can walk, but that's about it. I can't run. I can't move side to side. So all the things that I enjoy doing, all the activities that I wanted to do, I could no longer do. And so I went uh, to see a knee specialist. He started moving my knee around and, and kind of trying to determine what the issue might be. And to set my expectations rightly, he told me, your ACL's torn. We'll have to do an MRI to confirm that. But just know going into it, it's probably going to be a six-month process with therapy and surgery and all that kind of stuff. I went to our all-staff meeting on Tuesday morning, and we were in the middle of the Jesus Is series, and Ken was teaching on Jesus Is Healer. And I was sitting in the back of the room as he was inviting people to come forward thinking, I'm not the person he's talking to. This is for serious things, things that are bigger than just a knee. And so I was sitting back thinking, I'm not going to come forward, but just kept feeling this urge that, no, go forward, go receive prayer. And so I I went up and received prayer from Ken that day, that Tuesday morning. Uh, But Friday, I went in for the MRI as planned, went through the whole process. And they called me, I guess it was about a week later, to tell me that there was absolutely nothing wrong with my knee. There was no swelling, there was no tear, nothing was wrong. And so I began to go back to normal physical activities and have been able to lead our ultimate Frisbee missional community and continue doing all the physical activities that I have before, so much so that somebody asked me recently, which knee was it that you were hurt? And I couldn't even remember because I've been fully restored back to normal. So that was an awesome clip of Michael Sullivan talking about healing that he experienced with his knee. Mm -hmm. And now there are going to inevitably be skeptics among us who will question uh, the validity of Michael Sullivan's statements about his knee, whether it's they didn't actually believe that he received healing or maybe the doctors misdiagnosed it at first. In fact, there's a lot of skepticism about healing in general, about whether sure. it's real and whether it's still happening today or not. And I was wondering, do you have any thoughts on just the mystery behind that? Well, sure. And, you know, I think there is, as I said in the message, there is mystery, particularly around this this subject mm-hmm. of you know God's hand of, of healing. There's the faith component that's called for from us, so, so much so that even Jesus in that village said, you're not gonna see any miracles. Why? Because you're all skeptical. You don't have any faith. Um, so there is some sense of, well, you're not going to see them if you're determined to not see them. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, if you look, you, you do see them. How do we understand this? I don't know. It, it is a mystery. And uh, so I, you know, I went to college and graduate school too, and so I can ask questions myself, and I understand that. But I think there is some element of faith that, that we're, you know, called to have. Sort of like, well, you were telling me a minute ago when before we started, you mentioned the way that you've explained it to some of your kids in the student ministry. Tell, tell that thing. Right. Well, a lot of the high school students that I work with, they have a lot of questions. They have a lot of doubts. And they will ask me about things like healing. And mm-hmm. if it's real, you know, why haven't, it, why haven't there been videos of it on YouTube? Or, uh, or they'll have doubts about just even 
the existence of evil. Like if there's a good and loving God, then why do these terrible things happen? And sure. they have all those typical kind of questions sure. that many of us have Everybody a lot does. of the time. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the things that I tell them that's been helpful for me is I look at the story of Job and Job, you know, he had all these horrible things sure. happening to him and he didn't quite understand why these things were happening. Yeah. And so for a good chunk of the book of Job, he is kind of arguing with God back and forth saying, yeah. you know, why are you doing this to me? Yeah. But eventually by the end of the book, his conclusion was just to bury his head in the dirt and proclaim that, you know what, I don't know why this is happening, yeah. but what I do know is that my God is a good God. Yeah. And so I'm going to trust in that. And so what I tell my students is we are responsible for doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the things that we know for sure, we know Christ crucified Amen. and we know his resurrection. That's right. We know that. And so those are the things that we put our hope and trust in. And those are the things that we go back to so that when we confront these big questions, these questions that bring about doubt or anxiety sure. or whatever else, um, we can ask those questions and we can wrestle with those questions. But in the end, we don't let those questions overwhelm us because our trust is not in uh, seeing an actual healing before our eyes yeah. or knowing why evil exists. That's not what our trust in. Our trust is in Christ crucified and his resurrection, period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how I help them deal with some of those struggles. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that's good. It reminds me, um, I mean, even Jesus' closest friends wrestled with this. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Mary and Martha. You remember their brother Lazarus is, is sick, very sick apparently, and they send words in for Jesus, bring Jesus, we need Jesus. And, but Jesus sort of takes his time and takes the circuitous route and gets there, and by that point he's dead. Mm -hmm. And so they go up and said, Jesus, if only you'd been here. And, you know, and I think in a very real way, many of us have those feelings many times when there isn't the healing that we've asked for or the answer that we were hoping for. If only you had done it this way. Well, but, but what happened? Jesus said, now let me work. Mm. And he, he did it his way and his time, and it was good. And I think in the grand scheme, we have to j just draw back and say, okay, um, there is mystery to this. We, we don't understand it, so we do as Scripture says, uh, James chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, you have not because you ask not, so we ask. Right. And what he brings, we'll, we will trust. Mm. Um, in his time, in his way, and most of all, that he's good. Um, if it doesn't look exactly like what we were hoping for. So we just show up and we love him and we trust him because he's good. Absolutely. Pastor Ken, thank you so much for being here and thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.